Well, good morning. <clears throat> Again, I am Pastor Jake. I'm your Global Missions Pastor, and I am honored to be here. Uh, the third installment, the third week of our Family Focus Month, our Anchored Series. Before I go any further, I want to embarrass a couple people uh, because, um, well, they've done it to us. So uh, it's, <laughs> right? Vengeance and spine, saith the person with the mic. So uh, many of you know that uh, Michelle's parents were uh, long time uh, serving pastors, long time because, you know, they've been around a long time. And we've been, they've been visiting and uh, we've been going through slides because, you know, we still have slides from when they started their ministry and when Michelle and her sister were young. And this couple has been in ministry for uh, five decades, which is incredible uh, for, you know, you know, people in their early 50s. <laughs> nope, nope, not early 50s. Uh, so we've been watching, or we're just looking at these slides, and, and, and I've been hearing stories and seeing pictures of people that I've heard about over the years and seeing old churches where they ministered in. And uh, it's been an honor for me to, to join this family and to sit with them, to learn from them, to be included in this family. And um, uh, so if... if Howard and Barbara, mom and dad, if you just kind of wave, you don't have to stand up. They're back there. Yep. I did tell them yesterday that uh, in previous churches, they would occasionally have um, the kids come and play like a song on the piano. So I told them that I might have them come do a, a song for us. They said they would. But uh, and, uh, I've heard them sing and play, and it would have been awesome. Um, but anyway, thank you for, for being here, mom and dad. It's great to have you here. It fits uh, well in our series. My mother and father-in-law are easy to honor. They're easy to honor. We're going to talk today about someone that was difficult to honor. And what do we do in that situation? So thank you very much, Mom and Dad. <clears throat> so we've been talking about anchors. That's what this series is about, talking about anchors. But as Michelle and I were talking about this series, we kind of realized we never really defined anchors at, at length. you know. And so we wanted to talk about that a little bit today. What does it mean? We have this metaphorical idea. But an anchor is a device normally made of metal used to connect a vessel to the, body, the bed of a body of water to prevent that craft from drifting due to wind or current. An anchor's job is to keep a boat in its place. The captain can stop the boat, can turn the motor off, but that isn't enough. It's going to drift, right? There's currents and the water is always moving. Even in a lake where it's not going to go very far, it's still going to move, right? The water is going to move and it's going to move things that are on it or in it. So just stopping the boat isn't enough. It's not like a car that most of the time, though once borrowing a truck that my in-laws loaned me, I parked the truck and didn't put the brake on and found it half a block down the road a little bit later. I don't know if I ever told you that. <laughs> Worked out. <laughs> Worked out. I came out. Where's my truck? Oh, there it is. Across the street. Um, uh, no one else seemed to notice or mind, so I just drove off. It was fun. So it's not like a truck, though maybe like that truck. Wind and current will cause the boat to drift, right? And sometimes it'll drift it away. It'll just take the boat away down down water, down river, uh, across the sea. Sometimes it'll crash it into other boats, reefs, docks, uh, where things uh, can destroy the boat or people can be hurt. An anchor also provides a starting point. This is where the boat is, and from here I will map the next leg of my journey. It's a clear point of beginning. While we can't plan for every contingency in a journey or avoid every possible difficulty, we can avoid many by anchoring well. I think also of a rock climber. Rock climbers, when they're climbing up, and I, I'm not a rock climber, so I won't, if you are, forgive me, I will butcher some of these terms, but they'll climb up and they'll anchor and then climb above the anchor. So it limits their fall. If they make an anchor point and climb 10 points and let go of the rock, they'll fall, or 10 feet, excuse me, they'll fall about 20 feet or so. If they were to climb 20 feet beyond the anchor, they would fall 40 feet or so. So it limits the risk, and the, there is risk in rock climbing for sure, but it limits the risk and it li limits the danger. Metaphorically speaking, anchors keep us where we want to be and help us to remain true to our objectives when we're in challenging situations. 
Situations where pressures and currents might push us away from our principles, from our values, and truth. Right? So that's what we're talking about. Some anchors, anchors of belief, promise. So, uh, on week one, Michelle talked about David and Goliath and the anchor of belief. Last week, I talked about John and, Jonathan and David. John, right? John. Good old John. Johnny boy. <laughs> Jonathan and David and the anchor of promise or friendship. And this week, I'm talking about David and Saul and the anchor of honor. Like last week, I'll be talking out of 1 Samuel, chapters 22, 24, and 26. These are big chapters with a lot of text, and so I'll just be paraphrasing. There'll be some reference uh, verses on, on the screens, but you can follow along in your own Bible um, or read them later if you want the full, the full version. So I'll just be kind of summarizing these stories to kind of get us up to speed with David and Saul. So last week, where we left off, Jonathan has helped David escape. Remember that? Jonathan has helped David escape Saul's plans to kill him. It became very clear that Saul wanted to kill David. Jonathan now has accepted it. He had tried to resist the idea that Saul wanted to kill David. You know, surely he doesn't want to do that. Okay, let me see, because he won't hide any plans from me. It becomes abundantly clear to Jonathan, yes, he wants to kill you. Jonathan helps Saul escape. <clears throat> Again, Jonathan was a good son. He was a good prince. Faithful to Israel, and yet faithful to the Lord and truth. And so he was a loyal soldier, but also uh, treated David well, because he knew David was not wrong. So he did what was good and right. Despite this, despite David fleeing Saul, who was backed by the army of Israel, many of David's soldiers followed him. These were men that David had led for Israel and for Saul. So the committed treason by following David. 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2 says this, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's, father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So, so far, Jonathan, or David, after he left Jonathan, he traveled three miles to Nob, then 23 miles to Gath, and then 10 miles to the cave of Adullam. This is a well-known cave near Bethlehem, which is near David's hometown. So he's on his home turf. And there is story after story uh, in the Bible of God's people returning to places where either he had spoken to them or to other people. So they go back to these holy places, these sacred places, not because God is more there than somewhere, somewhere else, but because they know God has been there, and there's some reminders there. There's some truth there that has been experienced and lived and shared, and they want to reconnect to that. This cave was a place that David knew would provide shelter and comfort for this ragtag group of people. Now his followers, if he caught that, it said they were everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul or discontented gathered to him, and he became commander over them. Again, this is a ragtag group of people. They were the lost and the hopeless. This speaks to two things, I think. One, how badly things were under Saul. They're leaving Saul. They're saying, I'm not going to follow you. I'm going to commit treason. I'm going to follow David speaks to how difficult it was to live under Saul, how clear it was that he was off his rocker. Nutters, as I think the Hebrew said last week. And also it speaks to the kind of leader David was. They knew David was someone they could trust, someone who would do what was right, even at great risk to himself. So these were the lost sheep of Israel, and David at heart is what? He's a shepherd. So he brings them in, right? He says, okay, let's figure out what to do. So David is running and he's hiding from the king in the king's armor, his army. He's desperate. As John said, um, here he wrote Psalms 57 and 142. In this cave he wrote this while he's fleeing, fleeing Saul. I think it's possible that he wrote early Psalms and poems in this cave before. This was a place where God had, uh, he had worshipped and prayed before. John, during worship, read part of Psalm 57. 
But I want you to hear the rest of the story. He read the last part, but listen to the rest of the story. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp words. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into themselves. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O oh harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Your glory be over all the earth. Hear the desperation, the honesty, the pleading, and the belief in these words as he talks himself through this. And you get the sense that just like when he fought Goliath, whether or not God delivers on this, whether or not his enemies are trampled, whether or not the lions are, are scared off, he would worship the Lord anyway. Because the Lord is great. So he lands on belief, but he's honest about it. He's pleading. He's desperate. But in the end, he says this, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. The odds are stacked against him. And yet he has cho he's gone back to where the Lord has been before, to where he knows the Lord has been, has spoken to him. He goes back home. And he worships God all night. I will awake the dawn. Perhaps it took that long to come to this conclusion. As he's seeking God in fear and confusion. So now Saul is pursuing David. And he's following his trail to Nob. At Nob, something very important and very sad happens. The priests at Nob have helped David by providing weapons and food, and they've sought direction from the Lord on David's behalf. Now, in 1 Samuel 21.7, there's this sort of weird verse, and it says, Doeg the Edomite was there. He was just there, and then it moves on. And you're wondering why. Why are you mentioning this guy? Well, 22.9, uh, as Saul is pursuing David, it says that Doeg tells Saul that the priests have helped David. So he rats on these guys, right? And you see that Doeg is this opportunist. He's a bad guy. He, wants, he sees his chance to get to the top in Saul's estimation. And Saul is furious. He is furious. How could you help my enemy? How could you do that? He's furious. And he begins seeking. He orders that these priests be killed, and no one will do it. Who steps forward? Doeg, he's the only one willing to do it. And on that day, 85 servants of the Lord were killed because they helped David. That's the kind of people that Saul was associating with. That's the kind of person Saul was becoming. That's the kind of person David was honoring. The only other reference to Doeg is this. I think he kind of lives in infamy. I think David wanted to make it clear how he felt about him, and then let's move on. 52, Psalm 52, 1 through 7, kind of tells this story. Why do you boast of evil, mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You, you love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. Pretty clear, right? 
you know, we would say, you're mean, you know. <laughs> I think David does it better. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. Doeg has slain the innocent and the righteous, and David knows the Lord does not look lightly on this. A little later in the story, Samuel, 1 Samuel 23, David learns that the Philistines are attacking and robbing a town called Keilah. He inquires of the Lord as to whether he should go and fight on their behalf. So here he is, David's being pursued by Saul. We learn that David has 400 men. Saul is taking 3,000 of his soldiers. Soldiers, these are trained soldiers, not the ragtag group of desperate, lost, in debt, confused, discontented people. But 3,000 soldiers are pursuing David's 400 ragtag men. Despite this, when David hears that his own people, the Israelites, are under attack by the Philistines, he asks, should I go and fight? Do you want me to go to the rescue? And the Lord says, yes. And he goes, and he's victorious. Now it was told Saul that David, in, in 23.7, 1 Samuel 23.7, now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said this, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Keilah had walls around it. Now surely Saul, as king, knew that this town was in trouble, but did nothing. David, on the other hand, who has his own trouble to worry about, he's being pursued by this crazy king and all of his soldiers, David sees his people in trouble and goes to help, even at great risk to himself. He is, after all, a shepherd at heart. Saul only acts at the opportunity to catch his enemy, David, in this story. So here you have these two very different people, the current king and the man who will be king. And now we get to a couple stories that many of you are, I'm sure, very familiar with. 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 3. I thought I would leave this up here in a really awkward fashion at the end there. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engadi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David. So this is 3,000 of his best, right? And went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Yeah, David was pooping in the cave. It's true. Um, so Saul is chasing David, and he goes to this area where he thinks Saul is, or David is around there, where there's lots of places to hide. And as is customary, as the rules of the day, he would leave, you would walk outside of camp to relieve yourself. You'd have a little trowel and you would bury it. So he goes into a cave to have a private moment. He's king, so he wants some privacy. That's fine. Yeah, it's, it's kind of awkward and funny. It's fine. James said circumcised, so I can say relieved himself. So, <laughs> circumcised Philistine. <laughs> So, the Bible's awkward. Uh, David and his, some of his men are hiding in the back of this cave, right? They're back. They happen to be in the cave. They just so happen to be in the cave where Saul goes in to relieve himself. And his men are saying, here it is. God has given him into your hands. Let's kill him, right? Here's your chance. His back is to us. There's no chance of, of escape. Let's get him. David doesn't want to do that. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. But he does sneak up and he cuts a bit of the robe off, which tells us, you know, Saul had some work to do because he was able to get away with cutting off this robe. So Saul, he gets away with this. He cuts off part of the, the robe and then comes back and immediately feels guilty. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. And he persuaded them not to attack Saul. Saul leaves the cave, and David comes out and reveals himself. Saul, why are you chasing me? Why are you doing this? See, I could have killed you. Isn't this part of your robe? And Saul, in a moment of clarity, 
repents, I'm sorry, you've done nothing wrong, he calls him his son, and they part ways. And then a little later in 1 Samuel 26, this is another story, another similar story, though not quite as awkward. Saul is pursuing David, and they've made camp, and they've fallen asleep. 1 Samuel 26, 5. Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, with Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment, so he's got soldiers around him protecting him. They're supposed to be on guard when the army was encamped around him. <clears throat> it says here that the Lord put the, a heavy sleep upon them. So they're sleeping very deeply, all of them. The guard has fallen asleep. No one's keeping watch over the king. I think this heavy sleep has two lessons in it. One, it's a warning to Saul from God. Will you shape up? I'm, I'm helping David out here. Will you get your act together? Will you repent? Will you come back to me? I think it's also another test for David. Will you do what is right and honorable? And David sort of flirts with the line. He doesn't kill Saul. Instead, he sneaks in. And he takes his water jug and his sword and he steps out of camp and he yells and he wakes up the camp. And Saul, Saul, why are you chasing me? Why are you pursuing me? And he scolds Abner, the commander of the army. You should be put to death for not keeping guard, not keeping watch over the, the Lord's king, the Lord's anointed. I say he flirts because he probably shouldn't have taken the water jug. He probably shouldn't have cut out the robe, but how can you resist, right? So it's better, rather than killing him, I would say. But it's a test. It's a warning to Saul and a test for David. You see, one of David's anchors was honor. He would not fight or bring dishonor to the Lord's anointed. I think the key concept here is the Lord's. 1 Samuel 10.1, which Michelle talked about a couple weeks ago. Samuel has anointed Saul king, but this isn't random. It's not the result of democratic process. It's not even Saul's choice. He didn't campaign to be king. He's chosen. Saul was chosen by God, and he's, the Lord of the, he's, he's been anointed by the Lord to be king. And the Lord has not said that this is untrue. He has not changed his mind. He has not said Saul is not king. So in David's mind, Saul is the Lord's anointed, and David will not dishonor the Lord's anointed. We've seen that Saul is erratic, he's jealous, he has the army of Israel behind him, and he will send them on crazy errands to pursue David, even at cost of his own people, because he's so upset with David and so jealous. In this last incident, in chapter 26, Saul does say, please do not wipe out my people. Please keep my, my family line alive. So acknowledging you will be king and you will have chance to do the thing that Saul wanted to do. He wanted to wipe David from the earth. Instead, he's saying, please don't do that. Please keep my line alive. So he knows what's coming. He can sense it. But Saul is all over the map. David is trying to be faithful. He's trying to be anchored. He's trying to be faithful to God and his people while staying alive. So he isn't staying in a dangerous situation. He isn't continuing to be in Saul's home. He has left. He's continued to do what he thinks is right. He's risking his own safety to protect other people. He's looking after a difficult ragtag group of people. You see, David was a warrior who had seen the Lord do amazing things and had come to fear the Lord beyond and above all things. He had heard testimonies and seeing things happen, and he remembered those things. He wrote songs about them and sang about them, and he reminded himself of those things. And, and thankfully, he recorded those things for us, right? Both so we could read and sing what he wrote in, as an example. In his mind, fighting Saul was to resist and challenge the Lord's decision to anoint Saul as king. It would be to fight God, and he wasn't going to do that. David's decision to follow God meant he'd accepted the Lord's leading, and he was to be obedient. 
David was a shepherd and a loyal, loyal warrior of Israel. So he took in the lost sheep and led them into battle against evil nations because that's what he did. From Psalm 57, it didn't always feel good, but he was committed to doing what was right above and beyond what was good for him. So, so what? What does this mean for us? Only a handful of us are being pursued by someone like Saul, right? Some people, as I said, like my in-laws, are very easy to honor. But we've all been in situations or worked for or with difficult people. Of course, it's always wise to be open to the possibility that you're the difficult one, right? But that's not what this series is about. <laughs> Some of us are dealing with very difficult situations. What can be done? What do we do? We reconnect to our anchors, right? What do I know to be true? I set those things before, hopefully, I get into a turbulent time, before things get difficult. I set those things to reduce my drift, to reduce my fall. We are not presenting this month four easy steps to a conflict-free conflict life. If that's what you came for, I'm sorry. These anchors will not make every problem go away, but they may help us remain anchored and true to who and what we want to be, be like during difficult and turbulent times. They reduce the drift, the crash, and the fall, and they give us a starting point. So four things come to mind. One, give honor where it is due. Saul was a difficult person and he was doing many things wrong, but he was the Lord's anointed and so I'm going to honor that. I'm going to honor what the Lord has decided. At the same time, I might do some things differently than the Lord's anointed would want. So Saul, David continued to do and Jonathan and others continued to do what was right no matter what. So honor is not necessarily blind obedience. We continue to do the right thing. We trust God. And we seek the Lord honestly. So four things that come to mind from these stories. Four clues for ways to remain anchored in honor. We give honor where it's due. We do the right thing. We trust God. And we seek the Lord honestly. Now, I'm going to read the other psalm that David wrote in the cave. And you'll hear some similar themes to the, uh, Psalm 57. At the end, I'll pray, and the altars will be open if you want to come forward. Elders, staff, if you want to come forward as I'm reading this to be available to pray with people, that would be great. But that will be our closing this morning. Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge rain, remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for difficult stories that help us understand how you work in difficult times. We thank you for faithfulness. 
We thank you that we can be honest and open with you about our doubts about you, our doubts about life, our doubts about our direction and our way, and that you bring redemption and restoration to those stories. We thank you that you see better and more clearly than we do. We thank you that you're trustworthy. We thank you that we can share openly and honestly, not just the good stories, the great stories like we heard from James and Aaron, but other stories, hard stories, and together we can bring tr breathe truth into those stories and encourage one another to you. Lord, we thank you for this chance to come forward and to pray, to encourage one another. I ask that you be with all those here today that are dealing with incredibly difficult situations and circumstances and leaders, those who are in a place where they do not know what to do, those who feel alone, and forgotten, Lord. I pray you breathe, breathe hope and belief. Help us to be good friends to one another. Help us to honor those who you have put in place and yet to do what is right in an honorable way. These are not easy things, and so we need your help, Lord. And we thank you so much that you've given us your word and each other to get to this life in a God-honoring way that brings glory to you and shares your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, in your holy name. Amen.